All right, any more? All right, so, uh, man, just be uh, prayerful, but, man, we've got to <laughs> we've got to get that stuff up and rolling, but it's nice to see everybody today, and, uh, man, it's so it's so good. We're, 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 we're so used to coming into church, and uh, we sit in our rows, and we do our thing, right? And r- rows have been uh, around for a while. I don't, I don't know what it is about rows that uh, uh, people like to be organized in rows, and it's just a, a, a chaos from order thing. I don't know, but uh, it, it used to be, it used to be that rows was the way that wars were fought, right? And, and so in, in the not too... Not too far past, all wars were fought in these nice, neat little rows. Like, not, not for just a little bit. It's only for these last couple hundred years that wars haven't been fought with two rows of men fighting each other, right? And, and, and so all the way from the Old Testament, like up to 1865, I think, is when the Civil War ended. It, it, man, we had rows of people that would just go fight each other, right? And, and, and so a really interesting thing and, and so for me I feel like that's a little bit hard to imagine being in a battle like that just because one I'm not used to those kind of fights it's, it's weird especially when we talk like revolutionary war civil war style if you watch some of those different movies and things from that and, and the guys are just marching in their rows and then they just stop wait for someone to shoot at them and then they, it's like all orderly then they'll shoot back and it's like that's bizarre to me right is it anyone else have a have a, an issue with that? Like, I feel like I would have a, a hard time fighting in a war like that. Like, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to stand still, make sure you get that good, easy target while I'm at my attention, but I'm being a good, like, man. And, and so for me, fighting in rows seemed to, to become a thing that was like, all right, now, now that guns are invented, there's got to be a better way, right? There's got to be a better way. And uh, uh, trying to take the messiness out of war, um, but uh, it, it's kind of a bizarre thing, a bizarre thing. Uh, and, and then when you think of like swords and spears and shields and all those guys charging at each other, I understand wars being fought in rows in, in that way. And uh, of course, eventually people did it, adapt with guns to, to fight in a new way. But I, I can see that. I can see that a little bit. And, and as, as I was kind of thinking about all the different pictures I have, because I've, I've never seen that in real life. I've never seen like uh, a fight in in rows where where you've got rows of people charging at each other, but we do have some really uh, interesting movies that depict that. And so, so I was like, man, I, I I know we've got some good movies that depict that. So I've got a, a top five list for you here of of fighting in rows. And so before before we go through this, let me just say I'm not in any way endorsing these movies. I I think they're all famous enough that. Uh, we, we've all at least heard of these movies, and, and so uh, we'll jump into it. All right, number five, there was a movie called 300, and so we got a picture of it here. And so, uh, believe it or not, it was really hard to find a good picture of the men in rows in 300. I, I don't know what it was, if they had a three-year-old doing their costume design or not, but they fight in capes and undies in that movie, okay? And so it's kind of a kind of a strange thing, hard to find a good picture, but hey, here's 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 a row, okay? And so they fought in rows in the movie, and, and that's kind of what it's known for, is then when they're all together fighting in this row, that's it. So that's number five, last place. But number four, number four, four another movie that I've referenced before is The Patriot, okay? The Patriot, got another picture here. So this is that, that, those rows that I find, that's hard for me to just go, man, that is a bizarre way to fight, okay? It's bizarre to me. And, and the, the whole reason The Patriot is a movie anyways is because there's a guy named Benjamin Martin who didn't fight in rows. And so this guy gets his little special forces team together, and, and they are doing everything they can to disrupt the British Army in order to win and all this. But, but it's another uh, just good movie about fighting in rows, and eventually they do get in line, and even the, that little squad, that militia, uh, fights in rows at the end of the movie. So there's that. Number three, did I cut out? Number three, all right, number three, it's, it's weird to me to yell about movies. Number three is, is, is Troy, Troy. So we, we've uh, all probably heard of the story of Achilles and Hector, all this stuff. But, man, another really good movie where, where there's rows. Most of the good fighting scenes, though, are like the individual members, like the one-on-one stuff that's going on. But still another uh, good movie with uh, rows. 
Number our number two on our list is going to be Lord of the Rings. No, no, that's not it. That's not it at all. Man, you talk about ruining it. You talk about ruining it up there. That's not it either. That's not it either. And so, hey, Lord of the Rings. Golly, man, sometimes these things happen. But Lord of the Rings, this is one I would endorse. It's uh, actually an allegory for uh, Christianity, if you guys know, are familiar with Lord of the Rings and the Hob Hobbit. But man, this is driving me crazy. But Lord of the Rings, so many battles in all the different movies and in the Hobbit where people are just in rows charging at each other. And this is the, woo, this is the one that isn't uh, rated R on the list. So, hey, if, if you're going to look at any of these, here it is. And then lastly, lastly, we've got these rows in a movie. You guys will never guess what our number one is. Never going to guess but Braveheart. All right, so we've got, we've got these British soldiers here. Not that one. Not that one. These guys. So this is part of Braveheart. And so uh, these guys here are, the, the, this is actually the British Army in the movie Braveheart. And, and, and I won this slide here at this point because I want to look at this. And, and if you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be in this fight, we're looking at this Scottish Army. And, and so if you're going to pick in the rows where you want to be, where, where do you want to be? Every single person says the back, right? Uh, uh, that's an interesting thing to me. But because we look at that and we go, man, if, if I'm in that army, I, I want to be in the back. And I get that. If my, if my goal is to survive this battle, that's exactly where I want to be. If I'm in the Civil War and, and I'm in the, I want to be in the back, and I'm going to make sure I'm as, as immediately far behind this guy. Like, I want to be right behind him. I don't want to stick my head out. I, I, I want this guy to be my bullet catcher, right? A and so it's the same thing here. You imagine if you're in the back row and your guys in the front are doing stuff good, it, then you're just moving up behind them and you don't have to do anything until the guys in, in front of you die, right? A and so we look at these battles and we go, yeah, I want to be in the back. And that's right if your goal is to survive the battle. But, but if your goal is to win the battle, if your goal is whatever purpose the battle is, then we want to be on the front row. So that's what our next picture is for. And, and so here's this guy, William Wallace, right? And those are his main bros. And they go right to the front line. Wh why? Because th their goal isn't to survive the battle. Their, their goal is like Scottish freedom. And, and that, that's the goal of, of the battle. And, and, and so, so their point in going into it isn't just to survive. Their, their point is to win. They're, they're very zealous for a cause. They're very zealous and want to get in the middle of things. And so, uh, a, and everyone else, by the way, wants William Wallace involved. Not only is he a good fighter and, and skilled in this, but, man, he believes in what they are talking about, what they are trying to do. A, a, and so for, for the warrior, like, man, put me in the front is what they're all saying. A, and, and the reason I bring that up is for our Christian faith. For, for our Christian faith, because, man, the Bible's so clear that there's a spiritual war going on. In, in our default position, if we are not zealous for what it is we are, are trying to accomplish as God's people, if we're not zealous for, for trying to further the kingdom, then all of us have that same default reaction going, hey, I want to be that guy in the back row. Ooh. When... when, when, when what we should be is be looking like the Christian version of whatever William Wallace would look like. Okay, not so stabby, but you know what I mean. But but that's zealous for for the for the Lord and for the kingdom. And so, awesome title this morning. Awesome title. You ready for it? Front row Baptist. <laughs> Woo! Never heard the term. Probably never hear it again. Front row Baptist. And so uh, I am by no means knocking the people sitting in the back. Okay, that's not what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what this is about at all. No, no, no. No, it's about the spiritual fight. Uh, hey, we can sit on the back row in the pew and still be a front row Baptist, okay? And so y'all in the back, come back next week. Come back next week, okay? But front row Baptists. And so, man, that's, that's what we're doing as we're wrapping up our series here. The Lord is my banner. If Man, we've got this banner. Where is it that I want to be under that banner? I mean, really. I, and, and so the whole point of this last sermon is assess. Okay, I want to make the Lord my banner. I want the Lord to be the, the main thing over my life. And I say, okay, so where am I in the, under that? Do I want to be way in the back? 
Or do I want to be right in the mix of things? Ugh. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. Because what happens is when we start elevating those other banners in our life, all, all of a sudden the zeal for the Lord starts to diminish. We, we, we've talked about so many different other banners throughout this that we say we've got to be willing to lay that down. We've got to be able to will, be willing to lay all these other banners down. But, and, and because why? If they're too high, that means when I go into this other battle, where's my zeal at? Now I'm just trying to survive to do this other thing. Now I just want to go play Fortnite. I don't want to get in the middle of this. And, and so, man, the Lord is my banner, front row Baptist. And so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And, and, and we've got two stories today. Two stories. And, and I imagine most of you are familiar with these stories. If you're not familiar with the Bible at all, that's okay. You, you don't need to know these stories. In, in fact, we want you to come back. And, and, and you're welcome here, and that's okay. But we have two very familiar stories for people who've been in church for a while. And, and one is the feeding of the 5,000. Heard it since I was a kid. One is Jesus walking on water. Heard it since I was a kid. Right. And, 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 and the way we're going to read these stories today is together. And, and so when Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, he, he didn't write chapter 15, verse 1, and then write his verse, and then write verse 2. Okay, he, he doesn't put the chapters and the verses and, and the subtitles in there in the scripture. No, he writes it as one story, and this is one of those really good examples of that here. This is one story. Now, I know it covers multiple topics, but it all goes together here. So we're going to read it in that way. And what I need you to recognize here as we go into the feeding of the 5,000 is what Jesus does with his apostles. Okay. And, and so, again, we've heard this so many times, but realize what Jesus is trying to do is he is trying, man, that is so distracting. I'm sorry, guys. We've tried so hard this week. Uh, and so what Jesus tries to do with his disciples is he's always trying to put to do more. Okay? He, he, he's not wanting them to be spectators. He doesn't want them to be on the back row. Why? Because Jesus knows he has them. Right? He, he knows that they're going to be safe because he's the one that keeps them safe. But he's always trying to push them to do more and more and more. And that's really important for us to get. Don't miss it. Throughout his entire ministry on earth, Jesus is continually pushing his disciples to be better. He, he, he's continually doing this. And so he, he's, he's equipping them for the work that they're going to do when he's gone. And, and so, so four chapters before this, Jesus has given the 12 apostles some authority. We'll put Matthew chapter 10 up on the screen. But there's this verse where, where Jesus gives them authority. And he says, he called to him, his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. Okay? That's, that's a big deal. I don't have authority over those things. Jesus does. And, and Jesus can even give that authority. But, but, man, we see the apostles do some incredible things in the New Testament, right? And, and so it, it's important to get that that's where it comes from, is from Jesus giving them that authority. And, 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 and so here we are, Matthew chapter 14, keeping in mind Jesus is trying to get them to do more. Verse 13, now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate, desolate place by himself. Okay, and so John the Baptist is, sorry, quick side note, but John the Baptist has just died. That's Jesus' cousin, one of his homies, okay? He's just died, and Jesus is sad. And, and so he, he withdraws to a desolate place to pray is what's going on here. And we get to see even more of the compassion of Jesus, knowing that that's going on in his life. Moving on. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to, a disi to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. 
and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of them, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. So back up to verse 15. Back feeding the 5,000 here. Uh, again, verse 5 says, Now it's evening. The disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day's now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy themselves or buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Okay? He says, You do it. You give them something to eat. He, he's pushing them here, okay? He, he, he's trying to get them to do this without him. He's saying, you give them something to eat. Use this authority that I have given you. You give them something to eat. And, and so number one this morning is this. It's that Jesus wants us to bear more fruit than we want to. It's pretty simple. Jesus wants us to bear more fruit than we want to, and, and I think sometimes we think it's the opposite of that, right? So sometimes, for whatever reason, in our minds, we can confuse ourselves and think, man, if Jesus would just do this, then all these people would be getting saved. He's going, no, I, I want you to bear so much more fruit than you actually want to. Ugh. And so that's a really important thing for us to understand about Jesus. As a, as a parent, I feel like I might understand that better than I used to because I see ch my children, and when I see potential, I go, man, you have so much potential. You don't even know what kind of potential you have. A and then sometimes they'll spend that potential doing other stuff, right? We've all been there. But, but Jesus wants us to do so much more, he, and he's the author of life. You want to talk about someone who knows our potential, how about the author of that life, right? He, he knows what it is. He's trying to push them here. And, and so the chapter before this, in Matthew 13, Jesus tells the parable of the sower. He tells the parable of the sower, and one of the things we learn from that parable is, is that when the word of God is received by a heart that is good soil, that heart, that person, that soul is going to bear fruit. And, and so when the word of God lands on good soil, yeah, that, that person's going to bear fruit. But at the end of it, he says some, some of those are going to bear a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. And... and that verse is such an important verse. I, I, when I, because when I hear that, you guys have heard me talk about that verse before. I immediately go, "Well, I want to be a hundredfold. I, I, I don't want to be thirty. I, I want to be on the hundredfold side of things." Now, give an amen. All right, thanks. All right, so yeah, w w that's the zeal that we're not talking about. Okay, so, so man, I want to be on the hundredfold side of things when it comes to to bearing fruit. And Jesus wants that for us too. He wants us to bear so much more fruit than we even know is possible in our own lives. Because for whatever reason, we, we, we downplay what Jesus can do. When, when we start upplaying like how incapable we are, what we're actually doing is downplaying what Jesus can do when it comes to bearing fruit in our life. And, and, and so, so here, Jesus wants to bear, these disciples to bear so much more fruit. And it's not that these guys aren't zealous. You want to talk about some zealous guys? Hey, drop your nets, follow me. All right. All right, let's go. Th these guys, you want to talk about some people who are flying the Jesus banner high? How about Peter, James, John? Like these guys, man, they're all in this thing. These are some zealous dudes. And, and, and so, so we look at that where, where, where Jesus says, look, you give them something to eat. And we say, what's stopping them? They, they've got the zeal. 
They, they, like they're, they're all in for Jesus. How come they don't just go feed the people? And all of us go, well, they do exactly what I would have done because none of them know how. I, 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 don't know, I don't know how. I have never, let me tell you, I've never taken a few fish and some bread and, and been able to feed thousands of people with it. Okay? I've never done that. But Jesus has, and, and, and if Jesus gave me the authority to do it, and let me know that it was his will to do it, I guess I would try. And, and after reading this, we go, well, how come they didn't? How come they didn't even try? And it comes down to they didn't even know what to do. And, and I think that's so, so often our problem is like we don't even know how to verbalize that we don't know what to do. You guys ever been in that situation where like, man, I, I, I don't know how or I, I kind of get this partially, but I, I, d- I don't know exactly what Jesus is telling me to do? And so Jesus tells them what to do. He says, you give them something to eat. And, and, and they probably need some more instruction, but they sure don't ask. And, and instead of asking, okay, how? What, what is it that we, like, we, we need a little more instruction on this or anything like that? What they do is they immediately point out why they can't. Anyone been there? Ooh. Jesus says, you go do this. And they, uh, they immediately go to what is possible in their own mind. I had a friend tell me recently, like, man, we just can't do math with Jesus. But because that's, that's where I go in my flesh is immediately I go, no, uh, we have a very small amount of food and a very large amount of people. So mathematically, we cannot do that. But we don't do math with Jesus. You know, uh, the, the, if, if I look at our budget and our sound system, I go, <laughs> we can't do that. But we don't do math with Jesus. Who knows? If it's his will, we're going to get that sound system soon. I don't know. But, but the whole point is, man, they don't even ask him. They just point out what they can't do, and Jesus wants them to do so much better. In fact, in the very next chapter, he tries to get them to do this very same thing again when he feeds the 4,000. Right? So he said, hey, we've already seen it once. Surely they're going to get it this time, which they don't. But that's okay. We see Jesus being so patient with these guys as he's always trying to push them to be something better. Man, it's awesome. What, what great leadership says you give them something to eat. And all they needed to do, turns out, because we, we, see, we see how right here. All they had to do is say a blessing over it and ask. That's all they had to do. Now, they didn't know that. I wouldn't have known that. But they just had to say a blessing over it and ask for it. He, he'd given them the authority. He told them. It was his will. First John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. A- a- and so that really leads us into number two, because it's really easy to read this and say, but yeah, but I'm not always sure what g- the things are that I'm doing and if they're God's will or not. Number two, take the initiative to ask if it's his will. It's one, it's one of those things that should be so easy for us to, woo, man, woo. One of those things that should be so easy for us to, to get. Like, man, if you don't know, ask. That's what we tell kids all the time. If you don't know, ask. So, so take the initiative to ask, is this your will? I wonder how many times we want and just say, God, I, don't, I just don't know if this is your will. I don't know what you want me to do or not. We just got to ask. And, and and if we're living that life where we are abiding in Christ, if we're truly abiding in Christ, then we're going we're gonna to be a lot more aware of what that will is. And, and, and so if I'm, if I'm living that life where it's just like, no, I'm in the Word. I, I do have an active prayer life. I'm, I'm spending quality time with other believers. I'm seeking counsel. I'm doing all these things to help me to abide in Christ. I'm going to be a lot more aware of what God's will is for my life. And, and and if I'm still doing those things and I don't know, now it's time to pray and fast. That's what the scripture says. Now, 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 now we fast and say, okay, God, God, I'm, I'm desperate for you to, to give some guidance here. But we got to ask. We have to ask. And, and so uh, th- th- it's those who truly seek out God's will who are the most zealous for the Lord. And I, I feel like that's one of those things we know, that, that we, we get, and we go, yeah, that, that's true. No, no, 
those who really seek out God's will are the ones who are zealous for it. So, hmm. So why don't we? Why, why don't we want to zealously seek out God's will? God, God's way more interested in speaking to us than we are from hearing from him, which, which kind of goes back to number one. But, but because when, when I start seeking out that will, now all of a sudden, woo careful. <laughs> he might tell you something you don't want to hear. Yeah, so, so if I'm abiding in Christ and, and I'm seeking out God's will, there's a lot of things that can keep me from wanting to ask because God's will might not be for me to watch three hours of TV every day or, 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 or be on social media at all. I don't know what God's will is for everybody. But, man, it's really easy to just not ask. And, and, and like, like that gives us some type of excuse. And, and really what happens when we, when we stop seeking the Lord's will, really what we're doing is kind of backing up in our rows, going, okay, I don't really want to be in the front. I don't really want to know God's will that much. I want to. It's a lot safer back here. I, 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 I want to. There's. I'm gonna. I'm in survival mode now. Let's let them do everything else. I, I don't want to actually be part of furthering the kingdom. I mean, I say I do. I say I want to. And so that's what we see here. Is man, we've got to take the initiative to ask, Lord, what is Your will for my life? Are we zealous for? I, I mean, have we just been beaten down so much? That, that we just don't even want to anymore. Man, I'm tired. I don't, I don't want to do that. We've got to take the initiative to ask. And what I love about this story here is Peter. Because finally, one of the apostles gets it. Jesus comes. He's walking up on the water. And Peter, we see, thinks a little bit outside the box. And, and, and he doesn't say, he, he doesn't start looking at, 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 at what's possible in his own eyes. He sees Jesus on the water. He just saw Jesus feed thousands of people. And now Peter looks at Jesus and goes, can, can I come walk on the water? He asks. And Jesus says, come. Yeah. Come on. So Peter takes the initiative to ask if this is Jesus' will. And then he takes a step out of the boat. What an incredible thing. What an incredible thing that Peter has the, the, is zealous enough. I mean, this is like William Wallace zeal here, that, that he's got this zeal towards what Jesus wants for his life. And we say, well, that's not a big deal. So what? He stepped on some water. Hmm. Hmm. So, so what if all Christians have this kind of zeal when it, when it comes to seeking the Lord's will for their life? But, but because finally, finally, we, we, we see what Jesus, what Peter can do through Jesus. Finally, Peter gets to see it. Finally, the other apostles get to see it. And it's like, man, that better wake somebody up that Peter's out there walking on the water. Uh, th this story isn't so much about him sinking as much as it is, man, Peter actually tried. That's awesome. That's awesome, which leads us to number three. It's better to try and fail than to live in fear. Whew. It's better to try and fail than to live in fear. Because, hey, if you're going to try, if you try to do good at anything, you're going to fail over and over. Take that to any sport you want. Man, you've got to learn how to dribble a basketball. Well, hey, it's going to take a lot of failure in all these different drills. You're going to try to do your football drills. Well, it's going to take a lot of failure as we're learning to do this. But you're never going to get good at anything if you don't ever try. That's about the only thing I claim to be good at is I'm pretty good at trying. <laughs> Which means, by definition, I'm good at failing. All the time I fail. All the, t all the time I fail. Man, we've got to have the courage to fail at something new. Something I heard Jaden say a long time ago. I love that. Have the courage to fail at something new. But man, it's better to try and fail than to live in, in fear. And so finally with Peter here, Finally, the, the other disciples are, are, are sitting there. They're in the boat. H how come they're not going, hey, Jesus, I want to come out on the water. What are, what are they doing? They're on the back row. That, they're not the heroes of this story at all. But, but it's so easy for us. There's, there's two different ways that we can look at the story here. And so, so for the person who looks at the story, and who is a fearful person, we look at that and they go, well, Peter failed. 
but for the person who, who is truly zealous for the Lord, for the, the person who's that William Wallace on the front row, they're going, man, Peter's awesome. Good for Peter for actually trying to do something. Good for him to, for, for not being scared, for thinking outside of the box, for just trying. What an awesome, awesome thing. Why? Because, man, when, when, when we try, we're used to failing. We're just used to it. And, and, and it helps us to encourage others. Like, man, it's mistakes. Mistakes are no big thing. Like, I, I, I never punish my kids for mistakes. Disobedience, yeah, that's something different. But like, ah, oh, <laughs> you made a mistake. That's okay. Good for you for trying. And, and so that's what we, we see here. And so there's this, there's this famous Bible verse that I think is a really interesting verse. And, and, and here it is. It, it's 2 Timothy 1.7. And I think we've all heard it. It says, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I, I love that verse. Uh, a, a spirit not of fear. And I think there's a lot of, of, of people that that really resonates with, and I think there's a lot of people that that doesn't resonate with. But, because, again, it depends on whatever our, our approach is to being zealous for the Lord. I, if the Lord is my banner and I'm in that survival mode and I just want to be in the back row hoping I don't have to get put in, then I go, well, it doesn't really matter if I have a spirit of fear or not. That, that verse doesn't mean much to me. But, but for, for Paul writing to Timothy here, saying, hey, it's like, bro, we're on, Paul's on the front row, okay? He, he was the William Wallace of the early church. He's going, <laughs> look, Timmy, we, we are on the front row of this thing, but God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to fail. You might be like one of William's bros and get your arm chopped off. But man, it's okay. God is for us. And, and, and so, so it's so important for us to have that zeal for the Lord. Man, what are we doing? Well, where, where is it that I want to be? When we, when we hear the word and we, we see what Peter does, is, is that the kind of faith I have? Or am I one of the other disciples that would just rather stay in the boat? Ooh. Ooh. So we're going to pray.